Exodus chapter 1 and Hebrews chapter 11. Exodus chapter 1 and Hebrews chapter 11. Now, <clears throat> this morning, I am starting a series of messages on the life of Moses. The life of Moses. And I'll be, di- I'll be unhooking my train every once in a while and, and not necessarily preaching on that. But uh, this is going to be, as far as I'm concerned, one of the most important series of the messages. There are going to be so many areas covered. You want to learn about leadership, leading your home, leading your family, uh, leading in work and business, leading the nation. I'd be here. There's no, I'm telling you, Moses is one of the greatest leaders of all time. And in that process, he's going to tell you what leadership goes through, what leadership is about. That's one reason the New Testament talks about, about rulers, the gift of ruling. About if you read in Romans chapter twelve, you'll understand after you look at Moses's life why it says why you should pray for rulers and so forth, and that nature. But uh, we're going to just take off here and read in Hebrews chapter eleven, one of the greatest passages of Scripture in the Bible. It's all great, it's all wonderful, it's all eternal. But boy, this is one of my favorites, at least. In Hebrews chapter eleven, verse number twenty-three. Verse number twenty-three. We're talking on the life, preaching on the life of Moses. <clears throat> Verse number 23, is everybody there say amen? amen? By faith, Moses. Well, that just has a sound to it, don't it? Moses. When he was born, was hid three months of his parents. Because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, well, here it is, folks, now watch it. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as the dry land, which the Egyptians, are saying to do, were drowned. Now go to Exodus chapter 1. <clears throat> I have preached through the book of Exodus, of course, before. And in preaching through the life of Moses, it's kind of like going through the book of Exodus, several other things, but we'll be going on the focus of Moses' life. Exodus chapter 1, verse number 1. Now these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Every man in his household came with Jacob. You need to underline that phrase, came with Jacob. We'll get to that down the road some. Ruby and Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Nephtali, Gad, and Asher, and all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were seventy souls. And here's a key thing, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there rose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Now we're going to go down to chapter 2 and verse number 1. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. Now you're reading detail of the brief in Hebrews 11. Now when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes, daubed it with slime and pitch, put the child therein, laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river and her maidens walked along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she opened it, she saw the child. Behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me. And I will give thee wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him into Pharaoh's, brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And she said, Because I drew him out 
of the water. Moses is a type, as we preached last Sunday night, a foreshadow of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to preach one of the most important messages today that your family will ever hear, and not because I'm preaching it. It's because this will determine the future generations of you. What you do with this message, you're going to do something with this message. You're going to take it, receive it, ask God by His grace and His Spirit to apply it, or you'll just kind of toss it out, walk back out to your car and go home, and you will lose something. Your children and great-grandchildren will lose something. Deuteronomy 18:15 was a prophecy where we talked last week how that Moses said that the Lord would raise up a prophet like unto himself. That tells us that Moses is a picture, a foreshadow of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we talked about six, what was it, 65 or 68 ways that Moses, last Sunday night or when it was, was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not Moses we're looking at as making him somebody in the human realm. We're looking through, Je- through Moses' life right on through to Jesus Christ. And that's where the benefit of Moses' life will come. That's why I'm preaching on it. I'm not preaching on it to make something out of Moses. I'm preaching on it to make something out of Jesus Christ. And God put him in there. The Bible says all Scripture is profitable. Moses' life begins in a country, in a land called Egypt. That's where his life began. To understand and lay a foundation and to glean what we should from Moses' life, we need to understand and know about Egypt. And the first message I want to preach, or basically this is actually the second I want to preach, I want to preach about Egypt and why Moses is in Egypt and what it says for you and I and what we better learn from it. We need to know about Egypt not from some world history, secular world history perspective. We need to know about Egypt from Bible perspective, from God's perspective. Your founding fathers in this nation knew history from a biblical perspective. And they looked at all world history, and they looked at all the Romans and the Greek Empire, and the, and the, uh, the going back to the uh, uh, Persians, and the Babylonians, and the Egyptians, and they looked through all the world history through the prism of this book. And they looked at those nations and those kingdoms and those great powers and they said, why did they fall? Why did they fail? What happened to them? And they could see through Scripture why they did. Egypt has a very special place in the Bible. Tremendous prophecies have already been fulfilled that were prophesied and some are yet to be fulfilled concerning the nation of Israel. Father, we need your, the nation, we need your help, Lord, this morning. Lord, my mind apart from the Holy Spirit, would be fleshly and carnal. Lord, unless the Holy Spirit gets in this thing, Lord, and teaches us today, it'll just be sounding brass and tinkling cymbals and won't be no different than setting up at SMS in a stupid class, learning something that might have had value had it been looked at through the pages of Scripture. But if it doesn't, Lord, it's junk and can be our ruination. Oh, God, today I pray that you'd help us as a body of believers and as individuals, especially the fathers and mothers, and Lord, yes, even the young children here, Lord, to understand what it means for their life to come out of Egypt. Oh, God, today thank you that you delivered us out of Egypt. And Lord, save us from that propensity to want to go back to Egypt. God, I pray today that you'll teach us, bless us, Give us a good time in the Word of God today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What is Egypt? Where is Egypt? We're going to ask some questions. Why was Israel in Egypt? What does God want you and I as believers to learn from a Bible knowledge of Egypt? The Bible said in Romans 15, 4, that these things are written for our examples, that we through comfort and hope of the Scriptures might, that we through comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. God says, I want you to look back at the Bible, and uh, I'm sorry about this angle right here. We, the other projector wouldn't work. So I hope you can move it around and see that. But what does God want you and I as believers to learn from a Bible knowledge of Egypt? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Take your Bibles and look at that. And you want to write down, uh, and by the way, this is teaching message. This is more p- p- pastoring and teaching. The Bible says pastors and teachers. Uh, Romans cha- 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And uh, I want to read this passage of Scripture to you here. Verses number, actually let's kick in at verse number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, did I say Romans? Romans 15, uh, verse number 4 is the one I want you to give you there, but we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, everybody there say amen. amen. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant. Now he's going to go through a whole deal here about Moses and Egypt and coming out of Egypt. This is a very important thing that happened in, in, in history. 
Moreover, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock and followed them. That rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things were what? Our examples to the intent for what? That we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them. Why? For examples, and they are written for what? Our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And then he concludes by saying, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take he lest he fall. And tells you about God's, how God will help you through temptation. So it's very clear that as God is writing to these uh, epistles to the church, that he's going to go back in the Old Testament, and he's going to take you through all the experiences of Moses and the children of Israel, And he is saying everything that they went through and everything they experienced is for your example, for your admonition, so that you can maybe avoid and not go into some of the pitfalls and the things that fell uh, uh, to them. As most of you know, there were only two men out of the entire nation uh, uh, that was above that 20-year-old that ever got into the land of Canaan. There were some horrible things happened to them. And God wants you now to learn from it. So we say, what, what is Egypt? Number one, what is Egypt? Egypt is a type of the world. If you're writing down some notes, Egypt in the Bible is a type of the world that God talks about in the New Testament. The world is the system or the way of existence that is not only away from God, but opposed to God. You are living in the world, but if you're saved, you're not of the world. Now, here's what I have a problem with, and this is, I struggle with this personally, and as a pastor... And as a Christian, I see it destroying the churches of America. God took Israel out of Egypt. God brought them across that Red Sea and dry land. And when the Egyptians tried to come after them, God rolled that Red Sea up again. And he cut Israel off from Egypt with the Red Sea with the water. God, the Bible teaches, the Bible is like water. And when God saves you... He was going, he is, by the way, he will take you out of Egypt and he will cut you off from Egypt with the water of the word. But what our problem is, we have that flesh and we have a propensity to want to go back to Egypt. Let me say to you this. It was much easier for God to get the children of Israel out of Egypt than it was to get Egypt out of the children of Israel. And the problem with the children of Israel is the same problem that the church has today. He'll take us out of Egypt, but he can't get Egypt out of us. And that's what sets the fields on fire when you preach. That's what's wrong and why preachers have caved into their congregations across America. Because the congregations have done to their preachers the exact same thing that they did to Moses. And they said, Moses, we, we know God took us out of Egypt, but we've got Egypt in our heart. And we intend to keep Egypt in our hearts. And it destroyed. The Egypt is a type of the world. And we, uh, we recently studied on the outline, or if you've been here on Wednesday nights and so forth, studying on the doctrine of the world in Scripture. We said that the Christian is saved out of the world. Israel was taken out of Egypt. We've been given to Christ out of the world, John 17. Galatians 1, 4 said we were delivered from this present world. When God saved you, He took you out of the old realm of sin in this world and translated you into the kingdom of His dear Son. The Christian is to be separated from the world. The Bible said in John seventeen fourteen that we're not of the world. In 1 Peter 2, 11, it says that we are pilgrims and strangers in this world. James chapter 4 says that we're to have no friendship with this world. The Bible says in James chapter 1, that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. The Bible said that we're to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. The Bible said in Galatians chapter 6 that we are to be crucified to the world and that the world, if we are, the world will be crucified unto us. 
The Bible says that we're to live godly in this present world, in Titus. In Romans 12, it said that we're not to be conformed to this world. The Bible said in John chapter 17 that Jesus would keep us from the evil of this world. John chapter 1 John 2.16 says, Love not the world, neither the things of the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Listen, folks, what I'm trying to tell you is that the world, doctrine of the world as opposed to the church is a very serious doctrine that if not understood, believed, and practiced, will destroy your home and family and will destroy a church and will destroy a nation. The Bible said in Philippians 2.15 that we're to be lights in the world. We are, we are at John 17. Jesus sends us into the world. We are to preach to the whole world, the Bible said. The, the Bible said in John 16 that in this world you shall have tribulation. The Bible said, greater is he that's in us than he that is in the world. We are to have victory over the world through our faith, just as you read Moses in Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to have conflict with this in the world. And the Bible teaches anything. It is that we are to be come out and to be separated from among the world in our life, in every aspect of our living. How the Bible said in Egypt is a, is a type of the world and how God saves us delivers us and separates us from the world. You will never get to the promised land of Christianity without getting out of Egypt. You mark that in your day book. You'll never get out of there. Now you say, Reggie, where is Egypt? Egypt is in the continent of Africa. This is the Mediterranean Sea, and this is the, de- the, the, uh, the Red Sea. And up in here is, of course, Israel's right here. Jordan, Damascus, there's Beirut, Lebanon up in there. This is the Suez Canal right here, which up until the 1800s was not a canal. What they did when that canal was built there, that allowed ships to go through the Mediterranean Sea down into the, Red, into the Indian Ocean. Saved them from going clear around the continent. And that was done in the 1800s, late 1800s, by French engineers and British money. Anyway, that's a picture of Egypt. So now this is the area where Moses was, uh, was born at. It is on the northeast corner of the continent of Africa. Africa would be all down in here. It's the northeast corner of it. It was populated by the descendants of Ham. That ought to tell you something. There were three sons of Noah, uh, Shem, Ham, and, and, uh, and uh, Japheth. And Ham is the one who uh, is the, your, your uh, African people, your Mid-Eastern people. And uh, so Mizram is called, Egypt is often called in the Bible Mizram, M-I-Z-R-A-I-M. He was a son of Ham. And they migrated down in here. Now watch this. Because of this location, they became what's called the seed plot of Africa. The seed plot of Africa. Because the, as the peoples of Africa were populated, it came out of this area as they moved from the Mount Ararat flood area. And Egypt influenced Africa. Now, here's an interesting thing. Does anybody know what Africa has historically been called? The Dark Continent. The Bible said God is light and in Him is no darkness. Now you listen to me, Egypt is in Africa. And there is a darkness over that nation as in all the nations of Africa. And I'm telling you something, we've had missionaries there for now nigh on 300 and 400 years. And it is still a dark continent spiritually. It is in the southeast edge of the Mediterranean Sea. Which tells you something. The Egyptians were able to influence all the nations around the Mediterranean Sea and, in essence, influence the rest of the world with it. All of your perverted Bibles, which is all of them except the King James Version, came out of Alexandria, Egypt. Every one of them. Your NIV, all, the, all that junk came out of Alexandria. We're going to look at the libraries pretty soon. Joel got the, by the way, Joel... Got these pictures together for me, and I appreciate it very much. What is Egypt? It was once the most magnificent and powerful empire in the ancient world. But Egypt has been judged of God. Now as a, now as a nation, it is a nation under judgment. It is a conquered nation. It is a corrupt nation. It is a cursed nation. Because of its enmity and its willful ignorance, and rejection of the God of Israel. Egypt and its history is a small prototype of the picture of the whole world. The Bible takes this little land, this little land, 
and makes it a picture, a prototype of the whole world. Of the whole world system and its ungodly and anti-God attitudes and the result of that. You have Egyptian religion. You have Egyptian education. You have Egyptian arts. You have Egyptian sciences. You have Egyptian music. You have Egyptian philosophies of life. You have Egyptian architecture. Architecture. You have Egyptian governance. You have Egyptian politics. You have Egyptian entertainments. You have Egyptian pleasures. And you have Egyptian carnal security. Don't forget that one. You have Egyptian foods. And you have Egyptian attitudes. Why was Israel in Egypt to start with? How was it that Moses' parents wound up being in this place here? Well, in simplicity, first of all, and just going back to the basic thing, Egypt is a type of the world. Pharaoh's a type of the devil. Israel's a picture of a lost person and how God saves a lost person out of the world in his simplicity. But why was Israel down in there? There's three things I want to give you. Brother Bob mentioned one the other night here at the prayer meeting. Number one is, he was, I believe, he was preparing Israel for their inheritance. God had promised Abraham and Isaac a land. He had given them a covenant with that land. And God promised them that, and God's covenant was going to stand. What I believe is that God was preparing them for that inheritance. Now listen to me carefully. God put them through affliction. God put them through suffering. God put them through a, 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 a trouble. And God taught them to endure so that they would have an appreciation for and a right attitude toward that which he was going to give them later on. Can I tell you something? That the worst thing you can do is give your kids a bunch of stuff. Especially when they're young. You will make dependence out of them and you will make government dependence out of them on the third and fourth generation. God was teaching these people to endure hardness as good soldiers of the cross. Let me tell you something. It's good for you to be afflicted that you might learn his statutes, the Bible said. David said, it's good for me that I've been afflicted. You'll never grow much in the Lord until you've went through suffering, affliction, heartache, trial, temptation, and trouble. You don't get much on the high tops. You'll grow in the valleys. Do not, can I give you some advice this morning? Do not seek the easy life. Do not seek the pleasure life. Even when God took them up to Israel, it was not an easy place. They were going to have to whoop everybody up there. They were going to have to kill the giants. They were going to have to conquer the cities and the land. Do not seek for an easy life. This is the trouble with America. We've become rich. We've become wealthy. We've become materialistic. Until now, we've become a lazy people who want something for nothing and want the government to provide everything for us. Genesis chapter 15, uh, another reason, and I won't, you don't need to turn there, but I'll just tell you this quickly. Not only to prepare those people for, and by the way, can I say something to you? Before God saves you, you know, usually what he'll do is put you through affliction. He'll make you so sick of this world, you'll be glad to get out of there. And that's why I don't believe some people have been saved. You just said your little prayer, but you never went through the convicting power and the work of the Holy Ghost where you were so glad to get out of Egypt. If God told you to do 500 push-ups, you'd have done it to go to heaven. Y'all quiet this morning, it's okay, I guess you're listening. The second reason is the iniquity of the Amorites was to be made full. In Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 through 16, God told Abraham, he said, Your descendants will be in a foreign land for 400 years until the iniquity of the Amorites is full. Now you say, Reggie, what's going to happen to America? Let me tell you what's going to happen to America. Our cup's filling. It's called the cup of iniquity. And America's cup of sewage iniquity, the filth of this country, is is filling. And some of you wonder, where's God at? I promise you, when the cup gets full, God will take care of the iniquity. And he said, when the iniquity of the Amorites, which are the people up in here, get full, I'll be ready to bring you out of here, and I will bring you in. But I don't believe that's the main reason, neither one of those, the main reason that God had them in Egypt. Because God could have took them to Asia. God could have took them to Europe, but he didn't. Let me tell you something. You get this this morning. 
This will knock your socks off. And when I got a hold of this, I just went, my Lord. I believe that God was maintaining his righteous decrees. For the Lord has said in Galatians, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Did you know something? That Israel was simply reaping the sins of their forefathers. The twelve tribes, the eleven sons, sent Joseph, who is a type of Jesus Christ. They first of all sold him into slavery. Did you know what? They got sold into slavery by God. They sold their brother into Egypt as, as, a, as a slave. And God sent them down there as slaves. They sold their brother into slavery. And God says, you're going to reap what you did. Watch this. Number two. They not only reaped the slavery that their forefathers sowed, but they reaped the exact place where they sowed it. They sold Joseph down to Egypt. They didn't, send, they didn't send him up to Europe or Asia or so. They sent him down to Egypt. You know what God says? Number one, you're going to reap selling your brother into slavery. Number two, you're going to reap the exact place you, you, you sent him to. And for 400 years, the children of Israel reaped the iniquity of their forefathers in the land of Egypt as slaves. God doesn't miss nothing. And God's not joking when He tells you and I that we're going to reap what we sow. Let me tell you something. The older you get, the more you will realize that. And the Bible said that the iniquity is visited upon the fathers. Watch this. Upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Number three, not only did they reap the slavery that they sowed. Number two, did they not only reap the slavery in the place that they sowed. But exactly like the Bible said it would be. Do you know when they came out of Egypt? On the fourth generation. Now, folks, I want to tell you something. That rattled this old preacher. That made me take a start and say, you know what? We may think that we can get by sowing things. I'm sure, now listen to me today, night, this morning. I'm sure that when Issachar and Judah and Reuben and them brothers all concocted to sell Joseph down into Egypt, I don't believe it ever went through their mind that their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren would spend 400 years in slavery because of their iniquity. I wonder what we're sowing. I wonder what we're sowing. When God asks you and I to live holy and to live righteously and to live obediently, He's trying to help us. He's not one. He said it is not for your destruction. Israel was in Egypt because that's what they had sown. It was a foreshadow even of how they sold Jesus. Jesus was sold for the price of a slave, and he was sold to the Gentiles. Are you listening to me? And the Gentiles that he was sold to, the Roman soldiers, shamefully and reproachfully treated Jesus Christ And you know what? God did. God sold the Jewish people for 2,000 years to the Gentiles, to the times of the Gentiles. And for 2,000 years, the Jewish people have reaped what they did to Jesus Christ. And they also were, have been shamefully and reproachfully and suffered under the heel of the Gentile nations, such as Hitler, the pogroms in Russia, and even today the anti-Semitism that is across the world. Because of what, how they did to Jesus Christ. It is a pit, what they did to Joseph is a picture of exactly what they did to Jesus. And for 2,000 years, the Jewish people's blood of Jesus Christ has been visited upon their children. God tell you and I have the first lesson you can learn from the life of Moses. You are going to reap what you sow. Moses was born into that land. So what do we see? A picture of Egypt as the world. The law of sowing and reaping. Now, let's go into this real quick. Egypt, the world. Picture, so we understand this morning it's a picture of the world. The first thing I want to talk to you about this morning about Egypt is its river. Its river. This is the Nile River right here. It's the longest river in the world. Now, here's the thing. Here's what I want to get to. Let's get this down. We're going to talk about Egypt 
And that Egypt is a type of the world that God wants you to come out of. And that God wants you to be aware of how they operate. And that you're not to operate like they operate. Everybody got that? Now, I'm telling you, this is good stuff. And I hope you get a hold of it. The river here is Nile. And it it says something strange about the Nile River. It does not flow from the north to the south. It flows from the south to the north. You know where God dwells? In the north. You know where your compass needle goes? In the north. It's a picture of God wanting to take us out of the world to himself. Okay, now, it's the longest river. It runs south to north. This river is the life of this country. This country is nothing but a desert except about 12-mile wide space, all the way down about 12 miles wide. Other than that, it's just totally desert and wasteland. It's absolutely worthless. Now, it once was not. And it's an amazing thing. They're, they've found now in the last 200 years where at one time that, that area of the country was lush. But because of their disobedience to God over the centuries and their rejection of God and the ways of God, it is a desert place, but it has this river running through it. It's all desert besides. Now, here's an interesting thing. Once you get this, just, we're just going to teach now. Okay? I'm pretty, I don't have a good time, so I enjoy this. Here's what I want you to get. Egypt, like the world, enjoys the blessings of God of food, water, provision that you every day that you enjoy. But they never would acknowledge where it came from because they couldn't see it. Now, listen to me. This river, it just flowed down through this long deal there. And for century after century after century after century, they never thought about where has it come from. That was their attitude. Well, where did it come from? It came from the rains from heaven in the mountains in southern Africa and Lake Victoria country and works its way north down to the Mediterranean Sea. But here was the deal. Every day of their life, they get up, they go out there, fertile ground, about 12-mile stretch, water coming down through there, and, uh, and they grow their crops, and they even built their buildings and their materials. And I mean, most of the stuff they built came out of the river banks or as a product of that river. In other words, all the food, the clothing, all the blessings, the joys of life, everything they did was centered around that river. But watch this. They never considered the source of the river. This is what the world does. Did you know something? The world loves our national parks. They love our streams. They love our bountiful fields. They love all the blessings that we have every day. The air, the rain. I mean, people are walking into uh, the grocery stores this morning and they're just taking wonderful all kinds and manners of food off the shelf. And milk and honey and, uh, and juices and fruits and vegetables and apples and on and on it goes. And did you know they're walking through their Sunday morning and they're shopping and they're not giving a thought where that really came from. It's just like the, the world enjoys all the blessings of Almighty God. I'm telling you something this morning. The air you're breathing right now, God gave it to you. Your breath is in His hand. The food you ate this morning, God gave it to you. The water you drunk this morning, God gave it to you. Everything you have, the clothes you have on, God caused something to grow. God, the, I'm telling you, you say, I got a dollar in my pocket. It's made out of paper that God put in this ground. I'm telling you that everything you and I enjoy comes from God, but the world does not recognize it. They don't recognize it. The difference between living in Egypt and living in, in Canaan is that you recognize where the blessing comes from. Amen. Everything you're enjoying, I'm telling you, your house was built out of stuff that God put on this earth. Everything, the car you drove to church, the rubber that's on the tires or whatever it is, I don't care what product in the world, it is a product of God's gift. Every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from above the the, the Father, where there was no variable, the shadow of change in the Bible said, of turning. Now listen to me, everything in the Bible says, everything's good comes from God, amen? We got it. Now, the difference is you say, well, Reggie, I got folks living with me. They don't love God. Don't go to church. Yep. It rains on the just and the unjust. The difference is you understand where it comes from and they don't. The rains from above come far away. And it, see, here's the deal. It doesn't rain down here in Egypt. And they just think that, watch this, Mother Earth. They just think Mother Earth. And you know what that does to them? The world enjoys every day those blessings, but they don't recognize them. So the Egypt was like the world. Now, second thing is, they're like the world in their dependence. Now, watch this. Write this down in your soul. God gave this to me. They depended on the river, but not the giver. They depend on the river, but not the giver. Let me tell you what American government's doing right now. The whole essence of American government is to turn American people away from God the giver, 
to the government, the river. Okay? Canaan land is a land of dependence. You couldn't make it up here in Canaan land without rain. Down here, they said, it don't have to rain. We got the river. Did you know what? Most people don't even plant a garden anymore because they think they got the river. Because most people don't want to work no more because they think they got the river. They don't need God no more because they got the river. They don't understand that the river come from the giver. And without the giver, there ain't going to be no river. And what God's going to do one of these days is pull back the giver and the river's going to dry up. And this world makes dependence out of the river and not out of the giver. Egypt depends on a river, not the giver. We tend to think that we did it. We think we're the river. We're like, uh, what's the name of the Old Testament old verb? Belshazzar or Nebuchadnezzar. Look at what I've done. Look at what I've achieved. Look how stout I am. Look how good looking I am. Look how smart I am. Look what I've achieved. Look what I've got. When we get like that, we're just like Egyptians. Paul said, what hast thou that thou didst not receive? And why boastest thou as if thou hadst not received it? Everything you and I are. Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. Amen. I don't care what you've got this morning. God gave it to you. God gave it to you. You're nothing but a steward of what God has given to you. So anyway, it all comes to God. Your food. The air, our clothes, our cars, in Him we live and move and have our being. And this is the difference between the world and the church. And the church. That's why in the early days of this nation they acknowledged God. They understood that the blessings come from God. They understood that God, uh, Why did they limit federal government for? Because they knew the federal government couldn't. The only thing, it, the federal government has a river. Well, watch this. The river comes from the taxpayers through Washington and then it trickles back out once in a while. And more and more people are getting where they want to live down here by the river. And you know what's happened to us? America's drying up. And everybody's moving into the river. Moving into the river of government dependency. That's what this health care thing's all about. Let me tell you something about it. You will never in your life read a book or study a man or a people that will more tell you what's going on in your day and your time right now than you're getting ready to see right here. Egypt, like the world, did something. Now watch this. Egypt took the river over the giver, and so Egypt began to worship the river instead of the giver. And that's where America's at right now. We are worshiping the creature rather than the creator. And that's Romans chapter 1. Now, let me tell you what happens. You all know this. Romans chapter 1, you know what the Bible said? When they knew God, they glorified not as God, neither were they thankful. They don't have to be thankful. No, I, everybody owes it to me. I have an entitlement mentality. I want a house to live in, car to drive, health. I want health. I want this. I want that. I want food. I want everything. And somebody out there called the government is supposed to provide it. Now, you listen to me this morning. You don't like this preaching. I don't really care. I don't tell you what, if you ain't nothing but a blood sucking parasite, why don't you go to a liberal church? Or repent and get right. You a blood-sucking parasite living off your neighbor sitting in two or three pews from you. And they're working their guts out five days a week. And you're getting your check and your lazy hound dog won't work. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You ought to quit living down by the river and get living by the giver. Amen. That's exactly right. It's killing this country. I'll tell you what, I'd rather my kids be poor. I'll tell you what, I have prayed. I've said, God, don't let my descendants have wealth if it will take them away from you. Egypt, like the world, has its dependence on the river, not the giver. They worship the river, not the giver. They worship the Nile River, and that's the honest truth. They got to where they worship the Nile River. Now, is that dumb or is that dumb? But because they would not recognize the source, they started worshiping what the source had given. Now, they worshiped the Nile River. They, in fact, they had big feasts, annual various feast celebrations. And watch this. Now, watch this. Boy, I said, this, this ain't America. I've never seen it. They had their feast. We have Labor Day. President's Day. Every kind of day so we don't have to work. Now, watch this. 
They had celebrations, feasts, parties in their worship of the Nile River. But more than that, folks, they had literal worship systems of sacrifice to the Nile River. Is your bell ringing? Does anybody have any idea why would Pharaoh tell them to cast their small baby boys in the Nile River? Because they had a system of worship because they had made the river their God. Watch this. They sacrificed their kids to him. And the crocodiles and the pythons that lived in the river were some of their multiple gods. We're going to get into that. And so they took their babies and throwed them in sacrifice to the Nile River to appease their river so the river would keep flowing. I believe I, I, believe I got a hold of that. I believe we put, put our kids in these government schools and, oh, we all want it, and we sacrifice our kids so the river can keep flowing. And uh, so they put your babies. Hey, what do you think Moses was throwing the river? He was appeasing the gods. His God, the Nile River, feeding him and sacrificing to him. Yeah. Can I tell you something? That a lot of baby Israeli boys was thrown in the river and swallowed up and chewed up and wound up in the belly of crocodiles, pythons. Hmm. We got a God. We got a river God in this country. It's called pleasure. We love our river of pleasure in this country. And because we love our river of pleasure, we sacrifice our children. Can I tell you something, mom and daddies? Quit sending your kids to the babysitter so you can have more money. Don't put your kids in the river. You say, Reggie, what are you talking about? Well, the Bible said they begin to worship the creature more than the creator. And for that cause, God gave them more to reprobate mine. Next thing happened, they turned into a bunch of queers and sodomites. Hmm. Uh, I think a few years ago, we had a movement called in this country called the environmentalist movement. Take care of the rivers. Hmm. Uh, Mother Earth, which is a goddess term. We've got a magazine called the Mother Earth News, which ain't nothing more than a new age, paganistic, heathenistic slot machine. Then we had another movement come up in my lifetime called the Animal Rights Movement. It's where we, want, where we love crocodiles when we love our babies. And we feed our babies to the crocodiles. We're saving rats and owls and eagles and wolves. I mean, you go to jail for killing any of them things. But you kill your baby, it's just fine. You sacrifice, you can throw it to the crocodiles in the river. Isn't this something? Folks, I want to tell you something. Nothing's changed much, has it? We're just going right down the same trail that Egypt went. The Egyptian religion and worship system. Now, I'm going to tell you something right now. If you think Egypt don't like religion, you're crazy. Egypt, Egypt loves religion. And by the way, this world loves religion. They just don't like Christianity, Bible Christianity. It's only one thing. And by the way, Bible Christianity is not religion. It's a faith. It's a way. Now, I'm going to tell you how, what kind of religion they had in Egypt. This place here. We'll, we'll go ahead here. So, do I hit the right? Do I hit right? I'm hitting, there it goes, okay. We're just going to go through this. There's the pyramids of Giza. Now, you remember these pictures, okay? We're going to get this. They're King Tut. That's, that's his gold facial deal. There's the great sphinx. Notice something about that sphinx. It's got the man, but an animal body. There's the lighthouse of Alexandria. It's, a, it's actually gone now, but Alexander the Great built that. Ships could, by the way, you're talking about something, nothing new. They didn't have electricity, but the ships could see that light for 35 miles out in the Mediterranean Sea. That's not there now. That's a computerized drawing of it. It's gone, like all man-made stuff will eventually be. Here's the great library at Alexandria, Egypt. This is where all your false Bibles come from. They all come out of Egypt, not Antioch. Oh, can I say something to you? Isn't that a, boy, that blesses my heart. Boy, they loved education. Look at that. They had a great libraries. They were believed in education, brother. In fact, they got to where they worshipped education. See me like there's something. I believe there's a river. It's called public education. And I believe that 
There's canoes they ride down, yellow buses, yellow canoes. And then they got the river of money flowing from every tax player into it. And they're taking them kids all down that river. Here's the Nile River. But look at there. Just outside the river, what? Sand. There's Cairo, the river running down, down through it. Hmm. That's in Egypt? Yeah. You know where there's another one at? Washington, D.C. By the way, that's a filthy sign. If y'all know, anybody knows what it's about? It's filth. There's their astronomical charts. Did a good job, Joe. Temple complex. They were, they were religious. There are statues of their leaders. Rosetta Stone. Mount Sinai Summit. I'll go back to, I want to go back to uh, this deal about their religions. I will just stop right there. First of all, there are three basic tenets of all their religions. They were humanist, first of all, in that they worshipped man. Now, let me tell you something about the American people. We know more about Miley Cyrus than we do Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ in this country. You people don't, but the world does. People know more about Hillary Clinton than they do Ruth. They were humanists. And I want to tell you something about American people. We're people worshipers. That's why we call them stars out in Hollywood. That's why they put people out in front of you so you want to fix your hair like them, wear dresses like them, talk like them, like, like, like. You know, it makes me sick to hear young people go, like, uh, like, uh, like, uh. Why don't you quit saying like, uh? Why don't you just talk? (laughs) I'm being mean now. But they were humanists. America is a worshiper of man. By the way, we've deified ourselves. We think that we're, and we're, that we're, the Mormon church is a, it's, they think you're going, you're, you're gods. Second thing, they were not only humanists, I preach on humanism for three weeks, but we'll jump. They were naturalists. That means they worshiped nature. They worshiped, and whenever, let me tell you what's involved with nature worship. The first thing it does is get away from the God. It takes you away from the God of the Bible, which is a moral God and has moral absolutes. Okay. Once you've separated yourself from a God of moral absolutes and you worship nature, then you can go into your satisfying your own. You worship yourself and you worship nature. You worship so the creature more than the Creator. By the way, it didn't say they did. Well, this is the Holy Spirit is very careful about something in Romans chapter one. It said they worshipped and served the creature. More than the Creator. That's why people can walk into churches today and say, I'm worshiping God, but still go out and live like the world, dress like the world, talk like the world. I mean, the whole world nonsense. Because it's, it's a dualistic religion. <clears throat> it's called pluralist, pluralistic society. So they were naturalists. So that's how we got to where our owls and our bats and our coons and all that kind of stuff. And, oh, and by the way, our pets... I know you all don't like this, but I'm going to tell you something. It's a pretty sad day when we'll spend $2,000 on our pet. We won't give a dime for mission. It's a pretty sad day when I think this year they're going to spend something to the tune of $300 billion in the pet food industry in America. It's something to me whenever you can see guys walking around that hates everybody in the country, but they're kissing their poodle while they're driving down the road. Now, I'm going to tell you something. That's naturalism. It, worship of nature. And it's, 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 I, don't, I ain't got nothing. I, listen, I got a dog called Brixie. I think she's wonderful. She barks too much, but other than that, she's wonderful. But I don't worship Brixie. You got me? And I, can I tell you something? I don't even like Brixie compared to people. And we get this attitude that our pet, we love our pet more than we love people. You are a, in a spiritual mess, brother. You are in a spiritual mess. 
I tell you what, whenever your dog does something wrong and you just give it another bone, but your brother does something wrong, you have yourself a spell. You in a mess. When you forgive your dog quicker than you forgive your brother, you in a bad shape. You see, we're not so far from Egypt ourselves. And the third thing that they were, they were polytheists. That means they worship thousands of gods. Because, see, once you start, you can just keep adding to it. So pretty soon you have a god for anything you want. And that's actually what God dealt with when he sent Moses down there. Every one of those ten plagues, he was dealing with the ten major gods of Egypt. Boom, 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 he knocked them out. And God was showing them that. Now, <clears throat> Egypt is like the world in that it's big into education. They virtually worshipped their worldly Egyptian education system. And by the way, the highest, the height, the height of Egyptian culture was if you could afford to send your kids down to the Egyptian university. That, that you had made it. You, you were on top. Does that sound familiar? I mean, you can't get on the radio. You turn the radio on talk show. They're going, well, here, here, they're going to have a money show on radio. Well, here, here's how you, uh, here's how you get your kids this college savings plan. As if that was the only thing that mounted to anything. This week in the Houston Herald newspaper over here, the president of the University of Missouri wrote a big letter in there decrying these people who are decrying the higher education system in Missouri. And he's all ticked off because he's afraid the legislature might pull some of their money out of the river. I mean, he's writing, every, he's writing every newspaper in the country. You know why? I'm going to tell you something. Not because he wants your kids to go to heaven, because he wants that money to keep flowing in the University of Missouri. That's why. Protecting all those bureaucratic jobs. And so, through their education system, they controlled the masses and what they believed. Number two, now watch this. They were a nation They were, was big into the arts. What have you ever heard of the... Uh, National Endowment for the Arts. I guarantee you they'll, they'll thrust every anti-God. By the way, the new film out in Noah, I ain't even seen it, don't want to see it. I can tell you already, it's passed out of hell. The best thing I can tell from it, it's an environmentalist, wacko, stupid movie. I, I wouldn't spend two dimes going to see it. But you can still see their relics today of their artwork. They were huge into art. I don't know if we can get something like that right there, but they were huge into art. They were huge in art. And America has gotten huge into art. And I'll tell you, art is a place that reflects what's going on in people's mind. Art is, a, is an important subject. And God is an artist. And God loves godly art. But what man does, I'll tell you what, I never will forget being down at the University of Tennessee down there to a homeschool convention, walking down a sidewalk and looked over there. And I said, what in the world? There's a junk pile right there beside the sidewalk in the center of the complex of the ca- campus. Now, listen to me. There was an old refrigerator, if I remember right, a stove, a, 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 what do you call them? A, I call them a bathroom stool, a commode, junk and iron all piled up there, and it had plastic all poured over it. And somebody in the government had paid some idiot, and that was their prized art deal in the University of Tennessee. Danny, you remember that thing? You've you never seen that thing down there? I've seen it. And I'm telling you something. I've been in art college art classes, and I've never, ever, never been in a class where they mocked the Bible and hated God more than I was in art classes in college. I don't know what your experience is. I, mine, I still remember that little short, sawed-off piece of hellish junk standing up there in front of about a thousand kids in that big uh, area up in, 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 in Springfield and got up there the first day and said, in case any of you kids come from Bible-believing churches or Bible-believing families, said, you just want to get rid of that today. That's junk. That's gone. We're past that. Next thing they did, they worshipped architecture. They made it to last for ages. You know that, the pyramids and all that kind of thing. We'll try to go back to some of those. But they, they worshipped architecture. They built themselves huge edifices. You can see this. There you go, the pyramids right there. I've been in there. I've been up inside them things. You want to get eerie feeling and go up inside that. Anybody know what that is? It's not just a pyramid. What is it? It's a tomb. They're tombs. Now, this is what I want to get to, and we're going to go home. They worship architecture, and they worship sciences, falsely so-called. Are you listening to me? They worshiped science. The Bible falsely so-called. It wasn't really science. It was what they wanted to make science out to be apart from God. Where did it all get them? Where did, where did all this stuff get them? It got them to be a desert, barren, conquered, cursed, corrupted land. That's where it got them to. 
But all of Egypt and its education, its art, its politics, its science, its security, its carnal security, its architecture, religion, music, food, entertainment, pleasure, literature, was draped over and overshadowed with something. And this is where I'm headed right here. The whole nation became draped over with the culture of death. Now listen to me. God is life. Jesus said, I came to give you life and life more abundantly. Egypt, as a picture of the world, for you and I, was draped over with death. If there is one word that describes Egypt, and one word that describes this present world that you and I live in, it's the word death. It was a land of death, not a land of life. Vanity was stamped on its soul. The most important literature, anybody have to know what the most important literature work that has ever come out of Egypt is? What they call it. Guess what the most important literature that ever come out of Egypt? To this day, they'll take. It's called the Book of Death. The Book of the Dead. And you know what they did with it? It was so famous and so powerful in that country that you were to study it before you died. And then your Book of Dead would be taken with you into your tomb. As you begin to focus on death <clears throat> as a way of life, Thebes, which was the second most famous t- city outside of Memphis, Memphis and Thebes was the most two famous cities in Egypt. In the Bible, in the book of Ezekiel chapter 30, Thebes, the same town is called No, N-O. <clears throat> I'm there. You ever wonder where we got the word No from? It's from your forefathers who understood there's some things you say no to. And God literally wrote it across the face of Egypt's forehead. No, don't reject me. No, don't turn me away. No, don't go that direction. No, don't do that. And God, and because they did, God buried them. Thebes is the place where the necropolis is. What do you call it? Necropolis. Necropolis. Thank you. No, 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 no. That's, I think you got a different one there. This one here's got the op in it. You might be right. Okay, you might be. But I'll say this to you. It's called, you know, what the, what's that mean? It means the city of the dead. How many ever heard of necro, not, necropilia? Okay. Anything, N-E-C-R-O, dead, love, okay. One of the most famous places today is called the city of the dead. Egypt is known for its death. Guess where we learned how to embalm people at? In Egypt. They were experts at embalming the dead. And they took their dead and they put them in these huge monuments and so forth. Took their books of dead in there and believed in an afterlife that God never told them about. that was opposite of what God's was. So Egypt equals the world and the world equals death. So if you want to live like the world, dress like the world, talk like the world, think like the world, you just get ready to have a dead life. Amen. And it is the result of saying no to God. When an individual, a family, a culture, a nation says no to God, God will bury that, that culture in the sands of time. And death will come to that entity. I've been to Egypt. I was there with my mother and my brother and my wife in about 1983. And I'm going to tell you something. It is a dead, dirty, defiled, despairing, depressing country to be around. I remember driving by the Nile River, and this was no joke, being in the bus, looked down there, and there was probably eight or ten, I would say twelve to fifteen year old girls at the <clears throat> playing in the Nile River uh, uh, from the bank out about ten to fifteen feet in what looked like sewage. And they were throwing it on each other as if they were two kids down on Bryant Creek playing. I'm talking about filth. I'm talking about nasty. I'm talking about their human sewage running down through them little narrow streets in Cairo. I'm talking about stink. I'm talking about rot. I'm talking about ignorance. Because they rejected God. And God told Israel, I'm going to take you out of this place. And can I say something to you this morning? In all straight up honesty. I'm sorry that I rejected the truth that I was given when I was a boy growing up. But let me tell you something right now this morning. Whenever you're drinking and choking in your own vomit, when you're living in immorality, <clears throat> when you're lying and cheating, when you're living for the present, 
And I'm telling you this this morning. I was glad when God took me out of Egypt. Somebody says, Reggie, why are you so tough on music? God saved me out of that filth that's coming into most of our churches. God saved me out of that. God, somebody says, Reggie, why are you so rough on dress? Because God saved me out of that filth. And let me tell you something. When you say, Reggie, why do you preach on that stuff? I'm telling you, because God took us out. But you know what I say to you again this morning? We're going to go home. I know it's been long. But I promise you this. It's a lot easier for God to get you out of Egypt than it is to get Egypt out of you. Some of you have been saved for 20 years and you still remember Elvis Presley's favorite, your favorite Elvis song. You know what is so stupid? I heard the other day that they're having these Elvis deals down there somewhere in some town there in Georgia. And a bunch of 60 and 70 some year old women are down there all. Oh, mercy. They're still worshiping Elvis. Can I say something, dude? Now, here, here's what I got a problem with. This is what I'm saying. This is what I say. Egypt's in our churches. When I, was, when I lived in Egypt, when I was lost, Terry, I'd go to the Eagles concert and all the other concerts, and boy, I'll tell you what, they're smoking dope from one end of that room. To, anybody ever been there besides me? Okay, I'm the only one. Church says, okay, one guy. All right, one guy there. <clears throat> and you know what they do? Man, I'll tell you, that old concert, that rock concert, get wound up, it get going, boy, I'll tell you what. And, and they got more dope in them, and they got wilder, and they got wilder, and got wilder. And before they get done... <clears throat> I mean, half that whole stadium would be down in front of that stage, and the smoke are rolling, and the lights are moving, and them girls are just, ah! trying to crawl up on the stage, and the cops knocking them back, wanting to kiss the feet of those rock stars. My roommate at Drury College come home one weekend, had been to a concert of Black Oak, Arkansas. And said, Reggie, my girlfriend, he said, she went nuts. I said, what happened? This is the truth. He said, we got the black, he said, they were pre-running some big national deal. Black Oak, Arkansas got to play. And he said, my, my, I keep wanting to say wife, it was his wife's girlfriend, said she left me, ran down to the front, started taking her clothes off and trying to climb up on stage. He said, man, they some wild kind of spirit in that stuff. So when I go into a church service, or I see an ad on TV at James River Assembly, and there's smoke rolling off the stage, and they're up there doing this, 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 well, I mean, they're getting their cat on, and the kids are all doing like this. What do you think I think? The same spirit of Egypt. You know what we got now? Watch now. Here's one. You say, Reggie, you think them people saved? I hope they are. But I can tell you one thing. If they are, God may have took them out of Egypt, but sure didn't, but Egypt's still in them. We've got a bunch of yippies and yuppies sitting in our church houses bringing their old Egyptian lifestyle right into the church. Right. Amen. Let's go. That's enough. Amen. That's enough. Let's stand. <clears throat> Dear Lord, I thank you for your word. I want to thank you, Lord, today that you loved us enough to send a deliverer down to Egypt. That you sent the Lord Jesus Christ down to this old earth. And that God, there's only one thing that took over the power of sin and death and hell, and that was the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, today that, Lord, you came into this old rotten, wicked world, loved us while we were sinners. And shed your blood so that we could escape death and be delivered. But God, you did more. Oh, Lord, you did more than just save us. Lord, you didn't leave Israel down there in Egypt. You took them out of there. And God, you said, come out from among them and be you separate and touch not the unclean thing. And God, my heart is burdened for our churches in this land, for thy people. My heart burdened, Lord, for myself. Because, Lord, I've still got Egypt in me in various ways, Lord. It still surfaces, God. And, dear Lord, I know that you want Egypt out of our hearts as well as our bodies out of Egypt. So, Lord, I pray that as we preach these messages, Lord, that you would do a work of the Holy Ghost in my life, in the hearts of every person that attends this church. That, Lord, we would realize, God, that if we love you, that we'll come apart unto you. 
And Lord, I pray that you'd help us not to be part of the mixed multitude. There's always a murmur, always a complaining, always finding something to gripe about. And wanting to go back to Egypt. Lord, I pray that in this church and in these families, there'll be a recognition of what is worldly and what's of the Lord. And Lord, when something's of the world, they'll reject it. When something's of the Lord, they'll accept it. And Lord, give us the wisdom, the sight, the spiritual vision to see the difference. Lord, we need you. I want to thank you, Lord, this morning for your patience, your loving kindness, for your mercy. Lord, as I think this morning what Van said in devotion, that we need to give each other grace. We need to give each other time. We need to give each other understanding. But Lord, help us not to compromise while we're trying to be merciful. Help us to stand, Lord, on the truth. Bless these families. Lord, give them a good day today and a good week this week. Lord, I pray that we'll keep our mind stayed upon Thee and that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart, Lord, would be acceptable in Thy sight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for being here.